So where we left off last week was starting to talk about glands. And we're going to talk about glands. We're going to classify them a number of different ways and then talk about in specific types of glands. So we're going to classify them based on what they're made of, what they make, where they put what they make, how they get rid of it, and a number of different ways. That's not even all of them. Okay. So a gland is going to be something that's going to secrete a substance that's going to be used somewhere else in the body or in order to get rid of it out of the body. And that gland can either be a single cell, like the goblet cells that we saw in the lab a few weeks ago, or it can be an entire organ, something like our pancreas. That, the pancreas, is a gland. For the most part, these glands are going to be made up of epithelial tissue in a connective tissue framework. So the epithelial tissue is going to be the functional part of your gland. The functional part of a gland, the part of the gland that actually makes something is going to be epithelial tissue. You may or may not have connective tissue around it, but if you do, that connective tissue is only there for structure. The connective tissue will not be a functional part of this gland. If the gland is making something that is going to be used in the body, something good, something useful, it's going to be called secretion. If it gets rid of something that your body does not want, it's getting rid of it, it's going to be excretion. So if you're making something good, it's secretion. If you're taking something bad and getting rid of it, it's excretion. So excretion like exit. So an exocrine gland is going to have a duct that comes up and touches the outside of an epithelium, like a sweat gland. And so these surfaces can either be external, like, like the sweat gland, or an internal duct, like in our pancreas. The opposite of that is going to be an endocrine gland. So these are going to make things that are intended to stay in the body, and they're going to go directly into the bloodstream. These are primarily going to be hormones. So the hormone is going to be a signal, a chemical signal, that's produced in one gland. It's put directly into the bloodstream. It travels throughout the body and then relays that signal to someplace else. Things like your thyroid, your adrenal gland, and your pituitary gland are going to be examples of endocrine glands. They make hormones. They're responsible for communication in the body. Whereas exocrine gland glands are going to make more functional things, like sweat and tears. They're not, it's not a communication system. They're more functional things. Some organs, like the liver and pancreas, actually have cells that have functions that, like an exocrine gland and cells that function like endocrine glands. Generally, if you have a big organ, it's probably going to have multiple functions. If you have a very small gland, it's probably only going to have one function, and it's going to fall into one of these two things. So this is a picture of an endocrine gland. We have a gland, it's essentially a bulb that's going to form around a blood vessel. So we have blood coming into the gland up here, when it gets in the gland, it's going to fork off into a whole meshwork of smaller blood vessels. And then, at the other end of the gland, it's going to come back together and come out the other side. Why do you think it doesn't just stay one pipe going through the middle of that gland? What's the purpose of forming all of those branches? Increases the surface area? Increases the surface area, yeah. So all of these cells in the gland are going to be making that hormone or whatever it is that we're secreting. And so if we have just one artery going right through the middle, the cells on the outside are not going to be touching any sort of the blood supply. And so what they make 
if it gets in at all, it's going to have to work its way all through all these cells into the artery going through the middle. As it is now, every cell has a blood vessel right, right next to it. So it's easy to get those molecules into the blood. The exocrine gland down here is more of a self-contained unit. We have a gland. There is no big artery coming into it. And then in this gland are the beginnings of a duct. And then that duct is going to come out of the gland. And so everything that's made in this gland is going to work its way through the branches of the duct. The duct is going to get bigger and bigger and bigger as you go down the branches. And then you'll have one large duct coming out. And so nothing is really going to go into this gland. Up here, we have blood coming in. We add something to the blood on its way through. Down here, we make stuff. Then it goes into a duct specifically for that gland. So those were examples of glands made up of a number of cells. But we've seen examples of unicellular glands, like that goblet cell that we saw on part of the second week of class. So unicellular is just one uni, one, one cell. And these are going to be found in epithelium. So I said that the functional part of a gland is epithelial tissue. And so if you have a multicellular or organ that function as a gland, the functional part will be epithelium. If you have unicellular gland, it will be found buried in an epithelial tissue. And that cell that is functioning at the gland will be considered epithelial tissue itself. So it is still epithelial tissue. Whether it is one cell or a bunch of cells working as one, one gland, it's going to be epithelial. And these unicellular glands can be exocrine or endocrine. And so the goblet cells are an example. And then we have endocrine cells in our stomach that are going to secrete acid. That's another example. We're going to script, skip this slide so you can cross that one out. We're going to skip this one, cross that one out. We're going to talk, next we're going to talk about the types of secretions that we're going to make. And we're going to make a very wide variety of them. Serous glands are going to make very watery secretions. And these are going to include sweat, milk, tears, and then the acid in our stomach. And then there's some things with our intestines, like bile, that are going to be very thin and watery. We also have mucous glands. So mucous glands are going to make glycoproteins. And glycoprotein, remember, is protein with carbohydrates stuck onto it. That glycoprotein is called mucin. And mucin likes to hold on to a bunch of water. It's like a molecular sponge. So when these cells make mucin, all of the water from around it is going to soak into it. And so when that water soaks into it, then you have something runny called mucus. So what you have, the mucus, when you blow your nose, is not directly coming out of these cells. The cells are making a glycoprotein, which is not liquid, that then soaks up all of that water. So depending on how much water is on that mucin, that's going to determine how thick or runny the mucus is going to be. And this is primarily going to come out of our goblet cells. Remember the goblet cells had a little kind of tube that came up to the, the, the surface of the epithelium, and it could dump that mucus on top of the epithelium. Then there are mixed glands. And mixed glands is going to have the ability to make bulk. So you can make thin, watery secretions, and you can make mucus same time, or you can make both together. So you can make serous, you can make mucus, or you can do both at the same time. Finally, there are cytogenic glands. These are very specific, 
these are going to put out whole cells, not molecules or compounds. These are going to put out cells, and these are only going to be found in the, re in the reproductive system. So you're going to be putting out either sperm or egg cells. Pretty much everything we're going to deal with, though, are up here, since we don't cover the reproductive system in this class. There's also three ways that these glands can put out whatever they're making, or whatever they're trying to get rid of. There's going to be miracrine, apocrine, and holocrine secretions. We're going to talk about each one individually. So this is miracrine secretion. And these are going to take vesicles. We've seen vesicles a number of times now. And these vesicles are going to contain the product. Whatever needs to be secreted will be located in these vesicles. The vesicles will come off the Golgi, work their way up to the plasma membrane, merge with the plasma membrane, and dump their contents outside. So the, this vesicle will come up until it touches, and then the top of the vesicle here will merge with the plasma membrane. The plasma membrane will then kind of part. The vesicle membrane will become part of the plasma membrane. So what was inside will get dumped out. And so this is going to be found in your tear glands, your pancreas, and your gastric glands. This process is called exocytosis, which is something that we saw before in the cellular transport section. So exo exocytosis is the process of using these vesicles that dump something outside. If we see it in a gland, it's called miracrine secretion. Next way of getting rid of something is apocrine secretion. And this is going to be similar, but the plasma membrane is actually going to leave the cell with the product. And so this is going to be primarily found in mammary glands where you're putting out a milk product. And so we have the product coming up to the plasma membrane, and it kind of pushes up on it, and on its way out, and it forms this bubble of plasma membrane around it. And as it keeps going, eventually the plasma membrane will pinch shut. And then this droplet of milk will leave with plasma membrane around it. And so on the last slide, the plasma membrane stays behind. In this case, the plasma membrane is going to go with it. Don't worry about that part I crossed off. third type is holocrine secretion. So this is going to be like our goblet cell. It's similar to that. It's like a big version of, of that. Where you're going to find this is going to be the sebaceous gland. That's going to be probably the, the best example of that. So in holocrine secretion, we have this gland. And in the gland, we have individual cells and the cells that are in there are going to make a product. When, when we get to the sebaceous gland, we're going to see that the product they make is called sebum. It's essentially our skin oil. Okay? And so these cells are making this oil. And rather than exporting it out, they just make a bunch of oil, and then they die and disintegrate, leaving the oil behind. So in this gland, down here we have Here's a mitotic cell, so this one is actually dividing. Over here, we have live cells that are making oil. And then up here, we have dead or dying cells that kind of fall apart, leaving the sebum or the oil up here. So as you make new cells down here, you're going to push things up. The dying cells will get closer to the exit. And then as those go up, it's going to push the loose sebum up and out. So that's going to be holocrine secretion. It's sort of a suicide method. So the cells will make it, and die, leaving behind what they made. So moving on from glands, we're going to talk about membranes. And so membranes come in a lot of different types. And they can be made of epithelial tissue, connective tissue only, a mix of epithelial and connective, or even you can have epithelial, connective, and muscular. What you can't have is muscular only. So 
if you're going to have muscular tissue in the membrane, it has to be with either epithelial or connective tissue. And so some membranes that we've seen are the germator and the serous membranes. Right? We have a number of membranes we talked about in the, the brain, around the brain, in the spinal cord, the germator being one of them. The germator is an example of one that is connective tissue only. And so it's going to be primarily structural and protective, whereas if you have something that is epithelial, it's going to be more functional. Remember, ep epithelial tissue is the tissues that are going to be functional. They're going to have distinct, specific purposes. So a couple examples of that are the cornea and the lens of the eye. So we haven't talked about the eye yet, but you can imagine that the cornea and the lens of your eye are very specialized tissues. They have something that they need to do, and they need to do it well. And so those are going to be epithelial tissue. We also have what's called the cutaneous membrane, which is our skin. And so I'm not going to talk too much about this, these couple bullet points, because we have a whole lecture right after this about the skin itself. But the skin is, in fact, a membrane called the cutaneous membrane. We've seen mucous membranes, right? When we started talking about histology and cell types, we saw a picture similar to this. So what type of an epithelium is this? Based on the shape. So it's columnar. Let's take a quick... I was going to say pseudostratified. It's actually pseudostratified. I mean, you're at a tough angle. It's hard to see. But if you follow each one, they all actually do, in fact, touch the bottom. And so I, this would be pseudo-stratified. If somebody can find one that does not touch, I'll stand corrected. And so what we have, we have the pseudo-stratified columnar with our goblet cells. On top of the cells are our little fingers. And what are the fingers called? The cilia, right? So the cilia are going to flap, and they're going to move something in here, what's located underneath the mucus, in with the cilia? Saline. Saline, or water. It's, it's technically in saline, but the main, most important thing is there's water there. And then up here is going to be your mucus. So the mucus membrane has the epithelium, and then down below it is going to be connective tissue, usually areolar tissue, and then you're also going to have blood vessels and possibly some smooth muscle. Don't worry too much about these fancy looking terms. Just know that there's epithelium tissue and then connective tissue below it. These can have absorptive or secretory, secretory or protective functions. And so these can absorb things like in our intestines. They can secrete things like the mucus in our windpipe, in, our, in our, our lungs and things like that. They can also just have protective function, like the mucus in our nose. Then there are our serous membranes. So remember the serous membrane is a double membrane with a gap, fluid-filled gap in the middle. And so, remember, it has these are going to be internal membranes. You're not going to have serous membranes on the outside of our body. We talked about three different, three different serous membranes. What were they? There was one around the heart. What was, what was, what was that one called? Pericardium. Pericardium. What was the one around the lungs? Plural, yeah. And what was the third one? Peritoneum, right? And so remember that there's, there's two sides. The membrane on the inside is, so the, the outer one and the inner one. What's the one on the inside? That's the visceral one. What's the one on the outside? Parietal. And so we're going to have a simple squamous epithelial. Simple, it's one layer thick, and it's squamous. 
And that's going to secrete serous fluid into the gap between the two membranes. Right? And so this is going to be fine covering organs in aligning body cavities. Again, don't worry about the things I've crossed out. I decided you didn't need them after I gave you the slides. Finally, the last thing we have to talk about here is the growth of tissue. So we've talked about what the tissues look like, what they're made of, what they do, but how do we get there? Because they don't just show up overnight. And so tissues can grow by one of two ways. Either they can increase the number of cells, or the cells that are there can simply get larger. For the most part, tissues are going to grow by dividing their cells. There are only a few tissues that we'll see where the cells can actually get bigger. And so if I cut myself and I need to heal that wound, the cells around that are going to grow by dividing. They're going to make new cells to fill in the gap. It's not that the cells around the cut are going to get bigger. The growth of a tissue by cell multiplication is called hyperplasia. Do you think that us sitting in here right now have much hyperplasia going on? Always works out. No. No, why not? Because we're not doing much. We're not doing much. We've already made most of the cells that we need. Most of the kids are the ones that are going to be like right. So our cells are dividing to replace dead cells. If my liver keeps growing, that's not good because I'm not getting any bigger. If my liver keeps getting bigger, I'm going to have a problem. Kids, if you, until you reach maturity, they have a lot of hyperplasia going on. Plasia is going to be tissue growth. Hyper is fast tissue growth. Right? So us as adults are not really going to have hyperplasia. Wound healing may be, may be an example of where we would see that. Hypertrophy is cells that we have getting bigger. And where you're going to see that is muscle growth when we exercise or accumulation of fat in our adipocytes. Those are the only two places that you're going to see that happening normally. Okay? So if you exercise, your muscles are going to get bigger. And when they get bigger, it's because the cells themselves are going to get bigger. And if you stop at Burger King and you get a bunch of food and you eat it all at the same time and you didn't work out to grow your muscles, your adipocytes are going to grow. So basically, if you eat Burger King, one of two things are going to get bigger. Either your muscles or your adipocytes. Neoplasia is when hyperplasia gets out of control and is growing too fast. So in a child, that would have to be really, really fast, right? Because they have hyperplasia going on normally. So if it goes too fast, then the child will get a tumor. For us, if we have hyperplasia, Usually, that's going to be formation of a tumor. So neoplasia is going to be development of a tumor. Another word for a tumor is a neoplasm. And as you know, this tumor can be either benign, which is harmless, or malignant, which is harmful. And this tissue making up this neoplasia is not going to be normal tissue. This is not going to be just normal liver tissue getting bigger. If my liver kept growing, that would not be a tumor. These would be cells in the liver that went rogue. They're no longer liver cells. They're just going crazy in my liver, getting bigger and bigger. Yeah, go ahead. Why does it do all over the age of like 36 to end up with cancer and tumors and stuff if they're not going through hyperplasia? Very good question. So most tumors come, they're just Either you have a tumor that is gen based on your genetics that you were born with, or the vast majority of them are going to be based on things that we have been exposed to through our lives. And so the older that you are, 
the more times you've been exposed to bad things. And so every time we're exposed to something bad, errors build up in ourselves. But our bodies are made to deal with errors. And so a few errors aren't a big problem. But when you get older, you get errors on top of errors on top of errors on top of errors, and eventually it causes a problem. And also, as we get older, our bodies aren't as good as dealing with the errors. So even if you put yourself in a bubble and didn't have any more new errors, the old errors can still come back to haunt you. And also, every time your cell divides and re reproduces your DNA, you're going to get errors. Because you have to copy millions and billions of DNA bases, and errors do happen. It's actually about one in every million. Every, every million bases, you get an error. And you have billions of bases in your body. So you can imagine, errors are building up all the time. Right? Our cells actually make things like hydrogen peroxide, free radicals, just in normal metabolism. So those things go and react with your DNA, just like any sort of bad chemical you may come in contact with, causing mutations. And so that's why adults tend to get them in. Younger kids, usually, those that's going to be genetic tumor. Older people will probably be more environmental. I could talk about tumors all day. So, most t cells in tissues are going to be what we call differentiated. They are what they are, and they serve a specific purpose and they're no longer going to change. But tissues can switch. They kind of reach the bottom of the chain. They can't go any further and change, get any more differentiated. But they can back up, take a different path, and turn into a different type of cell. So differentiation is becoming a very specialized cell with one purpose. And so we have tissues in our body that are unspecialized or undifferentiated, and they're going to become differentiated cells. And so as we're growing, if we're a fetus, most of our cells are going to be what we call stem cells. They're not differentiated. As we get bigger and bigger, those cells will divide until we get a bunch of cells, and then some will differentiate into our skin, some will differentiate into our stomach, and our liver, and our brain. Metaplasia is the ability to go from one tissue type to another. In normal situations in our body, these are not going to be drastic changes. We're not going to have a liver cell becoming a kidney cell. You're going to, you might go from one type of a liver cell to a slightly different type. Of liver cell. An example of this is if you are a smoker. Inside your lungs, you have pseudostratified columnar epithelial tissue. They have cilia on them with a mucous membrane. The purpose of that system is to get junk out of your lungs. If you smoke, you damage the lining of your lungs in what takes its place is a stratified squamous epithelium. These cells will actually turn into these cells. And when they do that, you no longer have the cilia, you no longer have the mucous membrane. And so you lose that ability to get the junk out of your lungs. Even worse, maybe you lose the cilia, but you still have the goblet cells producing the mucus. So now you have this mucus building up in your lungs, and no cilia to move it around and get rid of it. So that's an example of this metaplasia, a changing of what type of a cell a cell is. So these stem cells that I mentioned are going to be undifferentiated cells that have not differentiated. Okay. In our bodies, these stem cells are going to be higher up on a differentiation tree. So imagine you have a stem cell. You have some stem cells up here, 
Some can turn into South C, some can be B, some can be C. So these stem cells up here are constantly dividing, making more and more and more stem cells. And then as that's happening, some of them turn into different types of cells. It's going to be rare in our body for cells to go back up to stem cells. The ability to do this is a huge, huge thing we're working on in research. If you've ever heard of induced pluripotent stem cells, that's what that is. Okay? It's essentially taking something, usually skin cells, and turning them back into stem cells so that you can turn them into something entirely different. In that case, you could take a skin cell and turn it into a liver cell. But that's not going to happen very much in our bodies. That metaplasia isn't going to come all the way back up to a stem cell and over, it's going to be more of a straight shot across. The ability for that stem cell to make very different products is called developmental plasticity. Plasticity or being plastic is the ability to change. Okay? Plastic things can change a lot, right? We can stretch them, we can bend them, we can melt them. That's being called plastic. And so the ability for a stem cell to turn into multiple things is called developmental plasticity. We're going to skip this slide. We're going to skip this slide and that slide. That's it. That's it. Okay. So then we're done with tissues. Questions on anything from last week, from this week? The slides that we just, yeah, go ahead. Uh, did you repost the slides, the ones with the Excel? I have not. No, okay. no. If, if you need to know which ones, if you're taking notes on your computer or something, just send me a message and I'll send you a list of slides there. So now let's move on to the integumentary system. So one thing that I saw a number of people mention in their extra credit on the exam was not knowing where in the book the things we were going over were. And I realized it was an assumption that I made that it was very clear, in reality it wasn't. So when I make these, these slides, essentially what I'm doing is I'm taking the slides from the textbook. The textbook has slides that go with each chapter. I'm taking those slides, deleting things we don't need to know, rewording things to make it easier to read, deleting bullet points that we don't need, and things like that. And so the slides are coming directly from the book. And so it's basically a one-for-one one thing. You may see some things in the book that aren't up here, which may make it seem like I'm jumping around, but in reality what I'm doing is I'm just deleting things. Okay? And so for the things that we've done in the past, if you need to know which chapter that came from, you can ask me. If we just look at the table of contents, it should be fairly straightforward. I think there's like a tissues chapter, and a chemistry chapter, and a cells chapter. Okay? Going forward, I'll be sure to leave this slide in from their, from their lecture so that you know exactly which chapter we're coming from. So we've already talked about the integumentary system a fair amount in lab. So we're going to touch back on what we went over, and then we're going to add some to it. So the integumentary system as a whole is going to be the skin, and what we call the accessory organs, which are the things that are buried in our skin, <coughs> including hair, nails, and cutaneous glands, which we'll see what those are at the end. And so skin is the organ that takes the most beating. If you fall off your bike, you skin your knee, right? If you walk outside, you're exposed to radiation. UV light is radiation. If we get infections, 
usually it's going to start on the outside. If we expose ourselves to chemicals, if you forget your lab coat on the lab, and you sit in a chair where someone had sat after they touched something, you're going to expose yourself, and that's going to be exposing your skin. If you look at why people go to the emergency room, why people go to the doctor, skin is the most common reason. Of all the individual reasons possible, something other than the skin is going to be the most likely reason someone's going to the doctor. And the study of the integumentary system is dermatology. So if you have a problem with your skin, you'll go to see a dermatologist. So this is a picture that we've seen before, right? And so we have the epidermis up top. In the middle, we have the dermis. Down below, we have the hypodermis. Between the epidermis and the dermis, we have this wavy pattern. What is the name of the parts that bump up? Ridges. The dermal papilla are the parts of the dermis that bump up. What are the parts that bump down? Say it again. Ridges. Ridges. It's the epidermal ridges. So dermal papilla are labeled on this one. The epidermal ridges are not. So the epidermal ridges are the parts of the epidermis that the bump down. The dermal papilla are the dermis that bump up. We had two types of sweat gland, apocrine sweat gland and americrine sweat gland. How can we know which one is which? And so here they're labeled. But if they weren't labeled, how would you know which one was which? Uh, where they go up to. Where they go up to, yes. So this one is ending in a hair follicle, whereas this one is going up to its own little pore. So which one is which? We see that the miracrine sweat gland has its own pore, and the apocrine goes to a hair follicle. So functionally, which one is which? We had two sweat glands that made slightly different things. Which one was which? Miracrine usually exocytosis, so if you like your sweat coming out of your exactly yes. Normal sweat, plain old watery sweat, is the miracrine gland, and it has its own pore. Whereas the miracrine sweat gland, the ap sorry, the apocrine, goes into a hair follicle. So that's going to be your key. Pure sweat is going to come out of its own pore, and that is the miracrine. If you see something emptying into a hair follicle, that's going to be the apocrine. What else? So, the skin, if you took all of your skin and were able to lay it out, it's going to be about two square meters, which is a lot. And of our body weight, the skin is about 15%. We talked about the three different layers. We just saw it on the last slide. And remember that there is thick skin and thin skin. Thin skin is the vast majority of our, sorry, I'm back, back, I'm back. Thick skin. I just said the same thing, wrong thing again. Thin skin is the vast majority of our skin. I don't know what I said the first two times, but the third time was correct. Thin skin is most of our skin. Thick skin is going to be the palms of our hands and the bottom of our feet. Okay? What you're looking for, primarily, is if you have hair follicles, you're going to be thin skin. If you're just superficially looking at skin, and you don't know where it's coming from, if you see hair follicles, it's going to be thin skin. We're going to see some places on our body with thin skin that don't have hair follicles, but if you do see hair follicles, it has to be thin skin. 
we don't have hair on our palms or the soles of our feet. We also don't have sebaceous glands in thick skin. So skin has a bunch of functions. Some are obvious, some are not. And so probably the most obvious is going to be protection from the outside of our body. Our skin has a few different parts that provide this function. Number one is the keratin. We've seen that keratin over and over again, right? We have keratinized epithelium on the outside of our skin on top of a bunch of dead cells. So that's going to provide protection. We also have what's called dermocytin and defensin. Those are two different things. And those are things that our body secretes that are essentially antibiotics. And so we have these antibiotics on our skin to keep away bacteria. Why do you, I mean, we, something that's coming more and more known is we have good bacteria on our skin all the time, right? And we're learning that if we lose those bacteria, bad things can happen. So if we have these things, why do you think we have good bacteria on our skin? To kind of just help it? <laughs> uh, something to get rid of? Think of we can't avoid them. Say it again? We can't avoid it. Well, let me rephrase this. If we have these things on our skin, how are the good bacteria able to live there? Let's, let's look at it from that direction. What's happening with all of the animals? If you go to the doctor and you have an infection, and they give you antibiotics, they say take the entire course of antibiotics. Don't stop if you think the infection's gone. Why? They'll get used to it. They'll get used to it. They'll get resistant. And so, the good bacteria on our skin have been there for thousands and thousands and thousands of years. They have evolved to be resistant to these. Things like E. coli that aren't normally on our skin aren't resistant to it. And so these things are able to kill bad bacteria but the good bacteria are resistant. We also have what's called the acid mantle. The surface of our skin is slightly acidic. It's going to be about pH 4 to 6. We'll see, we'll see this acid mantle again on another slide. But it just creates another environment on our skin that's not conducive to bacteria growth. So again, the good bacteria are used to it. They can survive it. Bad bacteria don't really like that acidic environment. Our skin acts as a barrier. It keeps water out. It keeps water in. It's going to prevent the UV radiation from getting into our bodies and damaging really important things like our vital organs and our muscles. It's also going to keep the harmful chemicals out for the most part. If you spill something on yourself, if you spill acid on yourself, you're going to burn your skin and most likely nothing else. If you spilled acid, directly onto your kidney, that would not be a good thing, right? Your skin can heal, you may have a scar, you can wash it off. If you burn your kidney in half, too bad, right? Your skin is also going to be playing a role in the synthesis of vitamin D. And so vitamin D synthesis has two parts. The first part happens in your skin. It takes UV radiation hitting your skin to cause that. What, what gets made in this reaction is then going to move on to your liver and kidneys to finish. But if the first step does not happen, your liver and kidneys cannot do their part. The skin, we know, is very important for sensing the world around us. It's essentially one giant sense organ, and we can use our skin to sense a lot of different things. Temperature touch things that we feel, and that comes in different whether we're touching something and how hard we're touching something. Our skin can feel pain. It can feel a whole lot of different things. It can feel whether things are wet or dry and a lot of things that you take for granted. 
The skin is also very important for controlling our body temperature. There are going to be thermoreceptors in our skin that are going to tell us how hot it is outside of our body. And so it will kind of allow our body to get ahead of the curve. If we walk outside and it's very hot, we know that it's very hot out, and so our body temperature is likely to rise. And so we can start sweating and doing things to keep our body from getting too hot. We don't have to wait until we're already too hot to try to cool ourselves back down. Our skin can also go through what's called vasoconstriction and vasodilation. I think probably the first week of class we talked about if you go in a cold environment, your body can actually reduce the amount of blood flowing into your extremities, but it can also take it a step further. It can reduce or increase the amount of blood getting to the surface of your skin. And so if you have vasoconstriction, the capillaries under your skin are going to shrink, so you're going to have more blood, less blood getting to your outer surface. If you have vasodilation, the capillaries will get bigger, you'll have more blood getting near the surface of your skin. Why would you want more blood getting to the surface of your skin? Cool. Cool. How is blood getting to your surface, the surface of your skin going to help you cool faster? Release heat. Releases heat because, if we're, thinking about it, if we're going to lose heat, it's going to be through our skin. I mean, if it's going to leave our body into the air, it has to be part of our body that's touching the air. So if the blood is located in our vital organs, it's not touching the outside. And so it can't, the heat can't leave our body. By getting more blood to, to our skin, we're carrying the heat next to the air so it's easier to escape. And so if you're exercising and you start overheating, you can get flush, right? You turn red. That's your body moving blood to your skin to help get rid of some of that extra heat. And then there's the perspiration, the sweating, that can help get rid of even more heat. And then, we've talked about it before, but the skin is very important in nonverbal communication. You know that she's not happy, right? It's very obvious that it's a fake frown, but you know she's not happy, right? Because if you, she was smiling, you would know that. And so the integumentary system, it's not just the skin, the eyebrows, a, the eyebrows are also part of the integumentary system. And so when you look at that picture, you are registering what her eyebrows are doing. If you think about it, when you normally look at a person, you don't even see their eyebrows. But once you realize you don't see them, and you start seeing them, it's one of those mind-blown, ice-breaking, shattering experiences. And the entire world feels extremely awkward until you forget about it. Right? So you're all looking at mine right now, and you realize you've never seen my eyebrows before, probably. Right? And so we get a lot based off just what someone's face looks like and how they're changing it. So talking about the skin, we talked about the different levels, so we're just going to very quickly go through them. So these are slides that we've seen before. So the epidermis is that top layer. It's primarily going to be dead cells with keratin on it. There's not going to be many blood vessels located in the epidermis. There's going to be blood vessels below the epidermis, so the nutrients will have to diffuse or migrate up through cells into the epidermis. There aren't going to be that many nerve endings in the epidermis. In the epidermis, we have five types of cells. We have the stem cells, which are the ones that actually divide and make new cells. We have keratinocytes, which are what most of the epidermis is made of. They make the keratin that's on the top. Then there are melanocytes. Melanocytes make melanin. We'll take a, a good look at melanin and skin color later today. There are tactile cells, which are the ones that feel whether you're touching something or and also how much pressure there is. And then there are dendritic cells, which are part of the immune system. So they're gonna kind of rove around looking for invaders to kill them before they get down into our bloodstream. 
So this is a picture we saw earlier. So on the top, we have stratum corny. So we, there are five layers of the epidermis. On the top, there's stratum corneum. Under that, stratum lucidum, stratum granulosum, stratum spinosum, stratum basale. There are five of them here. Is this thick skin or thin skin? Thick. How do you know it's thick? The lucidum. Correct. Stratum lucidum is the difference between thick and thin skin in terms of layers. Stratum lucidum is only in thick skin. If you don't have this, you will be thin skin. So we see, here's our stem cell. It's going to be, the stem cell and this melanocyte are going to be at the bottom. They're going to be in the stratum basale. Stratum spinosum is the biggest part. These are live, live keratinocytes. And then there are some tactile cells, a dendritic cell. So this is the vast majority of our epidermis. On top of that is the stratum granulosum. These are also living keratinocytes. And they have these little dark colored granules in them. So the dark colored granules are spots where what the term granulosum comes from. Stratum lucidum like lucid or very clear, it's going to be this layer. This is a, a clear layer. And then on top is the stratum corneum, which is going to be the dead cells. So that's what we just talked about, and this is what we went over in the lab. Down below the epidermis was our dermis. The dermis is a whole lot of collagen. It's primarily going to be connective tissue. There are blood vessels here, but they're primarily small blood vessels. They're more like capillaries. And this is where th like things like your sweat glands, and your sebaceous glands, your nerve endings, your hair follicles, they're all going to be down in the dermis. So your hair follicles, also the nail roots, we'll talk about our fingernails later on today. And this is where skeletal muscle is able to attach. And so if I make facial expressions, as I move my mouth to speak to you, my muscles are connected to the dermis. It's mo they're moving the dermis, and the epidermis has to go with it. So the muscles aren't actually moving the epidermis that you're seeing. They're moving the dermis underneath. And then there is that wavy boundary between the dermis and the epidermis with the dermal papilla and the epidermal ridges. Where can we see this on our body? Fingerprints. Yeah, I heard a couple people say it. Your fingerprints are those waves. So on things like your hand, they're much more exaggerated. So they're not those little waves that we have on our diagram. They're very big. And so that's going to cause your fingerprints. In our dermis, we had two layers. The top layer was the papillary layer. And this is sort of a loose connective tissue. It's not very dense. This is going to be areolar tissue. On the bottom is the reticular layer. This is going to be thick. And so the papillary layer is loose and so that things can move through it. You can have blood vessels moving through it. You can have leukocytes, your immune system cells, moving through it. You can have nerve fibers going through it. The reticular layer is dense. Why would you want a dense layer underneath that? It's so dense that you can't really have much going through it. So what's the purpose of it? It's the framework, yeah. It's going to provide the foundation. And so the epidermis itself, it, it's, it's more functional. It's, it's hard, but it's flexible. It's flexible, and it's not that big. And so underneath that, you have this loose structure 
where all the nutrients and, and blood vessels are going to be, and then you really need that hard foundation underneath, and that reticular layer is going to provide that. So in this picture, this is the epidermis up here, the blue is going to be your dermis, and you can see that up near the boundary, there is a lot of what looks like empty space. Here. And so this is the areolar tissue, and down here we have the dense connective tissue. Last week we learned that there actually isn't any empty space. What fills what looks like empty space here? Fluid. Fluid. So we, we have a specific term for it. Matrix. Matrix is going to be the everything out here, including fibers. Ground. Ground substance. substance. Yes. Thank you. Ground substance. It's basically water. It's kind of like jello, though. There are things in it that give it a little bit of viscosity, so it's a little thick. And so it's not just water, but it is filled. But it's clear. It's if you take a, a picture of it, you can't see it. If you slice something, it's just going to drain out. What was the term again? Ground substance. Down below this is the hypodermis, and this is going to be primarily adipose tissue. And there are blood vessels down here. What do you see as a difference between the blood vessels in the hypodermis versus the ones in the dermis? Thickness. Thickness. They're big, right? And so this is very loose. I mean, it's adipose tissue. There's a lot of wiggle room for, for blood vessels down there. And so we can have big blood vessels, and then we have little capillaries coming off of them up into the dermis. So we have nothing up in the epidermis. The dermis has small blood vessels, and then the hypodermis can have larger blood vessels. So this is, like I said, going to have a lot of adipose tissue it's going to be some areolar tissue. This is essentially the glue that's going to hold the epidermis and the dermis to the muscle or whatever else is below that skin. It's also going to provide some padding. If you have get a, an injection, a lot of times it will be into the hypodermis because you have all of these big blood vessels. If you did it very, very superficially, right into the surface of your skin, you'd be injecting it up here, or maybe down here, where there aren't all that many blood vessels. And so if you're giving a drug, you want it to get into your body and throughout your body. And so you want to get into the bloodstream as quick as possible. And so this is where a lot of injections are going to be. The fat also provides things like insulation and obviously the, the storage of Now let's go back and talk a little bit more about those melanocytes. So we know that melanocytes produce melanin, right? And melanin is something that, you I mean, that's a, probably a term you hear quite often. There are actually two types of melanin. There is eumelanin, which is the brownish, blackish melanin that we normally think of as melanin. And then there is pheomelanin. And this is going to have kind of a reddish yellow color. Obviously, brown, dark brown, or black is a more noticeable color, and so we see that a lot more. But this pheomelanin is also around at the same time. And so the fact that some people have darker skin and some people have lighter skin does not mean that the darker skinned people have more melanocytes. We all have the same number of melanocytes. It's just, in some cases, those melanocytes make more melanin. The melanin that they make breaks down slower. The melanin spreads out a little bit more. And it's easier to see those, the cells with melanin through the upper layers of the skin. Lighter skinned people, a lot of times the melanin clumps together and it stays down 
at the deep layers of our skin. And so imagine if you have a whole bunch of melanin, 